moving on, we are going to have Vivian Travelos and Leah Epton with their presentation on exploring action plans to op optimize community respiratory. Good evening, hello, and thank you for signing into our presentation. I'm Vivian Travelos. I'm a physio and I've been with the Motor Neuron Disease Association of Western Australia for just under a year and and I'm Leah Epton. I'm also a physio. Um, alongside my work in acute care, I've been offering a community respiratory care service for complex disability over the past two years. Uh, and we are based in Perth, Western Australia. And we're so grateful for the knowledge gained over the years from many mentors and incredibly passionate colleagues, including Michelle Toussaint, who's in his team in Europe, our Aussie peers, Nicole Shears, Dave Berlowitz and Sarah Wright, Hilda Perry in Vancouver and Brenda Morrow in Cape Town. And we know that good respiratory care can help individuals with MND or ALS to minimize respiratory distress and optimize quality of life. And we're currently working on ways to use respiratory action plans as one tool to help offer the right care at the right time, delivered as best as possible in the home. Um, so in Western Australia, we have just under 200 adults living with MND. And in this presentation, we don't yet have comprehensive data to show you, but we'd like to describe to you some of our local initiatives. And following this presentation, we hope that we can connect with clinicians to share what works for you in your local area and how we may build the body of evidence around timely community respiratory care. We know that individuals with MND live with progressive global muscle weakness and respiratory muscle weakness, and this makes it difficult to keep physically active and take deep breaths. And that contributes to fatigue and stiffness or decreased compliance of the whole ventilatory pump. And loss of deep breathing leads to difficulty with exchanging enough oxygen and carbon dioxide most commonly when lying down as enduring sleep and this results in hypercapnia and hyperventilation symptoms that present as poor sleep headaches sleepiness and shortness of breath and those with muscle weakness have great difficulty in managing saliva swallow and cough and individuals with mnd especially those with bulbar palsy um, are at high risk of airway obstruction and aspiration and the combination of these sequelae risk respiratory failure. As physios, our job is movement and that's supporting the muscles, the joints, the nerves and the body systems that enable movement and breathing and coughing is movement. And the good thing is we're learning more and more about how we can assist the movement of breathing and coughing using manual tricks, our mechanical tools to minimize the impact of some of these symptoms. Now, for example, the cough when really weak, can be supported by mechanical inexafflators, we call them MIE devices, and the cough assist is one example. And this device really was the beginning of my research career in the field of respiratory care. I was asked by families living with muscular dystrophy to build evidence um, around the value of MIE devices like this one to support a project that they had at the time to provide one cough assist to every person with a neuromuscular condition. But, come a long way since then, then so whilst I love MIE devices and I set them up regularly for some of my patients, my research journey really has helped me understand that one size does not fit all. The machine doesn't work for everyone and good physio, good respiratory therapists cannot be replaced by a $10,000 device. And the good, good thing in um, with COVID has helped us um, gain national and international recognition of the value of respiratory therapists, both in hospitals and in the community. And um, whether we have enough ventilators is now part of street conversation. And we're learning more and more about different and cheaper ways to support people who struggle to breathe and cough. And our expert international colleagues um, got together at a European Neuromuscular Centre workshop to map out this guide um, by consumer um, consensus approach. This guide helps us choose respiratory adjuncts um, that might be most appropriate um, with, to individuals with weak muscles who struggle with airway clearance, um, such as a cough. And it draws on published literature regarding critical values of cough flow in the middle here and vital capacity on the left here. The authors also considered relative cost 
and amount of, this, of assistance required for the initiation of augmentation techniques. And these threshold values are not absolute, hence the blurry lines. Clinicians also need to decide based on good listening to the cough and many, many physical and social um, contextual considerations. For example, if the patient is about half their vital capacity, about 50%, and that has a cough peak flow of above 160 liters per minute and this this yellow zone here we might consider first self-insufflation to the breaths manually assisted cough um either independently or with a lung volume recruitment um bag if their cough falls below 160 in this red zone here um, an mie device um together with the manually assisted cough um may help to generate um the most effective um, cough flow. The author's caution that this guide may not apply to those with vulgar dysfunction and therapy must be individualized according to local availability, um, efficacy for the individual, comfort, tolerance, and preference. And this guide is published in Neuromuscular, the Journal of Neuromuscular Disorders. So applied to MND, there's even more tools that we can choose in, in different combinations according to individual need, effectiveness and preference. And timeliness is tricky, but we know that the earlier the better. We try to monitor as regularly and as objectively as possible to identify need and offer to manage the sequelae of respiratory muscle weakness. So beginning with global muscle weakness, we try to find ways to keep as physically active as possible to help maintain chest wall compliance and elasticity needed to help with the cough um, we teach deep breathing and breath stacking to achieve big maximal breaths that the person can practice either independently or with the help of a lung volume recruitment bag with or with their ventilator um, if that's already been prescribed the timely provision and uptake of non-invasive ventilation can be supported by good community care, helping to identify signs of hyperventilation and troubleshooting things like mask fit, uh, placement of the ventilator for use during the day or night, and connection with the prescribing respiratory physician um, if questions arise. And timely management of drooling and impaired swallow is also a multidisciplinary role, and together with nursing, speech therapy and medical management, we can add humidification if indicated alongside other adjuncts to enable the cough, minimize the episodes of choking to optimize airway clearance, comfort, and in turn quality of life. So how do we best measure, monitor, and support and um, to treat our patients with MND? Um, the hardest thing in, for us has been the challenge of coordinating and delivering multidisciplinary care in a changing service landscape. So although our health, disability and aged care systems are all publicly funded, they function differently. So the new National Disability Insurance Scheme, the NDIS, is eligible to people under 65 years old, and it has all good intentions of giving participants choice and control over, their, over the services they purchase, but it has created a market economy and fragmentation of services. So access to disability and aged care in the community can be slow, making it even harder for people with rapidly changing conditions like MND to navigate and access timely care. So some initiatives we're taking to improve service development is to create community respiratory therapy roles specific to MND to support healthcare service delivery at home. So Leah started offering community care any day of the week through a private physio practice. My role is funded through a grant from the Tonya McCusker Foundation through um, Motor Neuron Disease WA, though currently I'm limited to three days a week. Respiratory physicians um, at the hospitals are lobbying the state government to specifically fund multidisciplinary services for MND through the hospitals. And we're really working to build a network of peers locally um, with, who have an interest in community respiratory care. So we've had some regular evening and day training sessions. Um, and it, at those events, we share um, amongst our professional groups and um, trying to build the skill set and resources, um, which are growing, which is quite positive. The part that I'm most excited about is exploring the use of respiratory action plans to support care coordination in a timely manner, and ultimately seeks to apply as up-to-date best practice evidence to help minimize respiratory distress and optimize quality of life for patients along their journey with MND. 
So let's just to show you um, what the um, action plans end up looking like. Um, this is an example of um, the uh, overall assessment um, tool that I use. Um, so the object of observations, looking at signs of hyperventilation, Cialuria, the um, scoring scale, the Epworth sleepiness scale, and the ALSFR. Um, and I'm also a big fan of the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale that I'll come back to. Um, that then um, feeds into considering management options. And here's the action plan. So there's a green zone is the daily breathing and coughing plan, then there's an escalation plan, and then there's an emergency care plan. Um, let me now hand over to Leah to show you what that looks like um, with um, the patient in action. Okay. So um, I'm just going to briefly present um, a case study um, on a client who was referred with difficulty clearing secretions and was having several choking episodes, especially overnight, um, and not using his copper Zeus machine due to discomfort. Um, as you can see on the ALS FRS score, um, Daniel had significantly impaired function across all domains. Um, and now if we move back to his action plan, thanks Vivian, his daily breathing and coughing plan um, when he was relatively comfortable and observations were within normal parameters involved use of nebulizers, TDS and his NIV machine overnight. Unfortunately, his um, manual insufflation exufflation machine um, wasn't set up um, at a comfortable level for him. Um, the next stage escalation of, of care was when I became involved um, and although there was a deterioration in his vital signs, my focus was on increasing Daniel's comfort levels. Care involved adjustment of his cough assist machine settings um, and increased use of nebulizers and mouth care. Emergency or end of life care occurred when Daniel became extremely distressed overnight um, and calling hospice nursing, nursing staff for further assistance with his choking episodes. In this case, I trialled a Fisher and Pipal humidifier with remarkable results. So on the next slide, I'd like to share with you um, his comments. Uh, so since the therapist came out with the humidifier and set up the cough assist for me, my breathing has improved. I am less congested, more relaxed, and I don't need to use the nebulizer as much. I am not stressed constantly about trying to breathe and I have been able to enjoy interactions with those near and dear to me. It is, has extended my life and improved its quality. Those around me have seen the difference. Yeah, I think the most wonderful thing about this is that he typed this out on his eye gaze. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Um, it was testament to the comfort you were able to provide him. Thank you, Leah, for sharing this powerful story and how trying different respiratory adjuncts in good time um, that we know work in other conditions can make a qualitative difference to comfort for patients with MND at end of life. And it's so much about setting up equipment properly to suit individual need. An impact on service provision is being evaluated by patient feedback that equipment is set up appropriate um, to the individual. So that's going all the way from timely saliva management, many assisted cough, LVR, NIV, um, and um, MIE um, optimal setup that the equipment is actually used. Then it's looking at minimizing use of emergency services. Like you mentioned, he called out um, the ambulance in the middle of the night and we want to minimize those um, occasions and maximize efficiency of service. So in our service provision, um, minimize duplication and optimize timely communication between service providers. Um, and to evaluate impact on the individual, um, it's really about support and acknowledgement of their symptoms, um, perceived comfort and, and minimizing distress. And um, that's where the WEMWEB's mental wellbeing scale comes in really handy. Um, and facilitating comfort at end of life and having them pass at home if desired. So it's the early days in our West Australian journey and we're mindful of firming up clinical governance and scope of practice amongst the multidisciplinary team out in the community. And we're persevering as much as possible with peer information sharing, upskilling and support, which has also inspired us to prepare this talk tonight. So to finish, in context of a fragmented reorganizing health and disability service delivery model, we hope that action plans driven by community-based respiratory therapists can enhance home-based care minimize respiratory distress and optimize quality of life in individuals with MND. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. And um, so Vivian, it's just you joining us this afternoon, this evening, today, tomorrow morning. Yes, yeah. thank you. Yeah, Leah's been called to ICU, so she's run off. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, respiratory therapist. Um, I thought that was a really interesting presentation. I loved how you mapped out the whole um, time of how you were looking at everything. Um, I loved your action plan paper. It seemed incredibly detailed. The action plan? So, yeah, so there's a couple of patients for whom it's too detailed, so we've had to simplify. <laughs> some, some patients love it, and some, um, yeah, we've cut the... Um, the details it's really emerging of um, the British Thoracic Society um, the like it comes from asthma action plans the um, again colleagues in Queensland have done a very detailed one for um, the um, hospital physios there so it's, it's merging it and, and um, hijacking things and making it specific to the individual okay yeah so yeah you pick out kind of an a la carte more of which they yeah. fit, fit that person. Um, so there are some questions. Do you track hospitalizations related to pneumonia or other? I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I am definitely now because we need to, yeah, we really need to, um, yeah, we don't have ro robust data yet that really needs a prospect, re retrospective and prospective um, study. So it's, it's early days on that yet. And um, there's data from other populations. Um, so having come from um, a, a pediatric background in the last, so a, a while back, there's some good data out of the UK of um, the value of community respiratory physios. They pay for themselves within half a year. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, there's data in other populations that say if we do respiratory care properly, we save lots of acute care costs. Right. I, I think that happens so many times with uh, physios. We, we come up with an idea. We think it's a great idea. We implement it. We ask the people we're working with who say, yes, I feel better. This is better. And then we're like, you know what? I should collect some Data. I should have measured that. Yeah. So we were just thinking we've just got an ED project now that we need to, need to apply for funding for. And I think we've probably done ourselves out of a or too good a job because now we don't, we've kept them out of hospital. Ah, there you go. You think, yeah. Yeah, but no, um, we need more robust data. So, everyone, again, that's a collaborative effort um, numbers wise, like you mentioned for Timothy's neck. Um, posturing that's uh i'd love to have a more, more numbers on board so we can um right at least at least start with a pilot gathering a pilot number and then then apply for yeah know, yeah i mean respiratory management is so important as as people are commenting on and um i i think so many times like you mentioned you think of the you're thinking of the machines, you're thinking about what what are they gonna get almost at this end? And just like everything else we've been talking about um, throughout the APF, there are so many things you can do in between. I really liked your slide that had the pictures of the exercises and the different maneuvers uh, um, that people can do before it's not just high tech. Yeah, like in the, in the muscle strength training, just the really basic stuff like bubble pep. Physios love bubble pep. And I've had a couple of um, patients in the last month who've given that a go. Swimmers, Western Australia, we love the ocean. <laughs> but then we're so worried about aspiration and mouth seal. So now she can't hold the 10 mil tube anymore. So now we've gone to a snorkel um, because she can hold it between her teeth and, and do mm -hmm. some bubble pep like that. So it, yeah, you can be quite creative in the beginning before, yeah, as, as long as possible. I also loved your, your um, peer upskilling. And I think we should, the, that whole term, I've never heard that term before. I think the APF, maybe we can, we'll call this now the peer upskilling forum. Sure, thank right. you. Are there any other questions or is there anything else, anything you else you found out in the data that surprised you or a last comment you'd like to make? The, um, yeah, really just in terms of individualizing care, when, um, because we do love the cough assist or the MIE so much that um, really being careful with um, being specific for the ones who have bulbar palsy versus um, more generalized muscle weakness that yeah, we, we can undo some good by cranking the pressures up too high in the bulbar palsy. 
that needs to be fairly fine-tuned. So if you're not 100% sure that it's working for your patient with vulvar palsy, please call in the rest physio to do a thorough assessment of whether you're actually getting airflow. Because um, sometimes we can, we can cause harm by giving them too much. And then there's a question about the tracheostomy decision. Like if yeah. people are um, educated on that massive question in Western Australia at the moment and really physician um, specific uh, again because the funding model for disability care has changed so the the costs of community care are um, driving some of the unfortunately some of the conversations so um, we don't have guidance in West Australia yet and we'd love to hear from uh, jurisdictions that do have um, a protocol because it sounds like we've got one um, adult on a, on a trackie and, and three who are knocking on the door, but the physicians are quite resistant um, at this point in time because they're nervous about all the post care. Um, so it's more patient driven than physician driven at this point in time. We've had, yeah, the one that does have the trackie was an emergency um, insertion. And are they still at home then or did they have to go into? Yes, they're all, yeah, they're all, all, all at home. Okay. All right. Well, we. Um have to wrap it up now so people can have their break. <laughs> but thank, thank you so you very much. much Sarah, for hosting. Very interesting and um, great presentation. Thank you. Thank you for hosting.